Welcome back, everyone, to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully. Gordon is traveling. As we mentioned on the last show, though, we released the 2017 film about Jenny Simpson on our YouTube page for all to enjoy. Well, today we have the star of that film, Jenny Simpson herself. Jenny, thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing? I'm great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun to virtually connect as we are doing these days. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And as we mentioned, we put the film up. So I had to, I rewatched it. Um, 2017 is when it was shot, although it does a really good job of hitting on all basically the key points of your career, the highs and lows. Um, what were your memories just of, of shooting that film and having the opportunity to reflect on at that point was a completely full career, but now it's four years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, I probably should have rewatched it before this podcast because <laughs> my memory <laughs> might not be perfect four years later. But uh, but maybe that's better because I like can express what I actually remember four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that I remember the most was the terrible snowstorm that blew in and the weather during the filming of that. And um, I even when you and I were emailing about this podcast, I even said then like it just felt so appropriate that for the video that you guys would come out and shoot for me, that the weather would be kind of brutal and we would get kind of the combination of like something that's really difficult and uncomfortable and challenging, but at the same time, it's beautiful and it's scenic and there's, there's something really beautiful in struggling through those tough days. And it just felt like that was the more appropriate thing if you wanted to see behind the scenes. Uh, because what you see in races and on the track is often when we're at our best, we're uh, in these sleek uniforms in the best shape of our lives. Uh, so it felt more appropriate to show a little bit of the hardship. Yeah, you have obviously the awesome drone shots there of you running in the snow and they did some close ups on your feet. You can see that you put the yak tracks or whatever they're called, the things to, to keep you from slipping and sliding. And then your coach, Mark Wetmore, describes your workout as being relatively you know, boring, like you're in the indoor facility. So it definitely was not this glamorized view of, of, of training. Is it still the same for you? Are days looking pretty close to that, minus all the COVID restrictions? Yes. Yeah, and actually we had kind of a harsh winter. And so uh, even the like little bit of gloominess that I think the video portrays kind of well, you know, you're, we have a beautiful facility uh, and, and it's this big cathedral ceiling looking inside the IPF and uh, the indoor practice track. Um, and and it's, it's, it's awesome, but just the weather can kind of bring a gloom over everything you're doing when it's just cold and, and, uh, and cloudy outside. And so we had a lot of that this winter. So it does feel like, um, like this winter is, is similar to what we shot there. But um, I, I think what you said is, is really true. And I'm glad that Mark said it in the video that I had kind of a boring workout. There's so much of what we do that is more similar to what everyone else is doing. You know, there's, when it comes to running and training, there's so much more overlap between what a high schooler is doing and an elite athlete is doing because we're all running, we're all doing, you know, mileage and uh, threshold runs and intervals. And so there's, there's a surprising amount of overlap. And I think uh, it's tempting to think that the elite athletes have this whole different world in which they're training under a completely different context with different routines. Um, but it's just kind of the normal every day, put in your miles and put in the workouts. And there's some that are really exciting and sexy when you get into the summer and you're doing, you know, really hard 400s and 200s getting ready for 15. Um, but I mean, the majority of that base work is just slogging through tons and tons and tons of miles, anywhere from eight minute pace to 530 pace, depending on the day in the workout. Towards the end of the piece, you mentioned that one of the things I get asked all the time is how much longer am I going to do this, which is interesting because again, it was 2017 and here we are in 2021. And then Mark also mentioned we're looking more forward than back. And at that point you had three medals, but since then you've won another medal, you've run 358 again. Is that mindset the same still that there is this, um, there's things that you still want to accomplish that, that you haven't got gotten off the your uh, your checklist yet yeah you know what you guys came out to do is show a little bit of behind the scenes and so i'll give you an even more behind the scenes of of <laughs> that of 
some of the, the context of that moment. So during January, February of that year, um, there was some talk about going back um, and trying to get um, a promotion into the medals um, of my steeplechase in 2009. And um, mm -hmm. there's some reason to believe that I should have, I, I'm, I'm right now currently sitting in fourth, I think. Um, and so that 2009 medal was a little bit like, there's reason to believe that I should have been moved up and other people should have been moved up. And so there was some discussion during that time of, of what was happening there. And um, I remember with maybe some amount of hubris saying, the best chances for me to get another medal are this summer at the World Championships, then trying to look back and, and get, get something that already mm. has happened. You know, that bureaucratic process is just really difficult. And, and it's, it's like, it's almost to, to that, you know, the, what actually ran through the finish line of any world championships isn't what holds true years later. Um, so it's, it's a fraught experience when, when medals are made. Um, I just remember like trying to tell myself not to hold out hope that I would get that steeplechase medal and to still really focus on the future and really focus on the summer. Um, and at the same time, I was having a lot of, um, just there were things in my personal life that were difficult, just things that my family were going through. Uh, and so it was a, it was like a really fraught, challenging time. Uh, and it was really important to me really just to focus on August, you know, focus on June, mm -hmm. July, making the world championships, uh, and focusing on like, what are we actually working for in this moment? It's not all these difficult things that have happened in the past. It's really pointing towards the future. So when Mark says we were forward thinking, it was that way in so many ways that we didn't even know maybe how to unpack at that time and of course looking back now um and so i go and you know we may or may not talk about this but i go through the summer make the team go to the world championships and really really against all the odds um pulled off another medal performance in that summer and that was just so like validating and fulfilling in a way that other medals hadn't been in the past um just because of the context of the year and, and training for that so I have kind of taken that moment in my career and tried to allow that to be a lesson for me forever in saying, no matter where you are, no matter what you're trying to claw back from the past, uh, as long as you stay forward thinking, like that's your best chance at success and progress is to think about what's ahead. Mm -hmm. We're definitely going to talk about that 2017 race because I will talk to anybody about that 2017 race, uh, you in particular. At the beginning of the pandemic, when everything was shutting down and we had nothing to talk about on this podcast, uh, I think we did an entire episode dedicated to the 2017 women's 1500 meter final because it's my favorite. It's one of my favorite races of all time. I think it's one of it's in a group of four or five men, women, doesn't matter. Best races. There's so much going on. You could write an entire book on the last 600. I mean, just the names that are involved, the moves. Obviously, you're a big part of that. Your last hundred, like you can go frame by frame and dissect, like how did she get through on the rail? Um, <laughs> so now that you're here and I have the opportunity to ask you, what do you remember from from 2017? Because that didn't get in the film because, uh, you know, Fenton maybe didn't think, you know, you were going to get that medal. So he's like, let's do the film in 2017, not 2018. No, I'm just kidding. He would never. That's funny. Well, I mean, I had just come off an Olympic medal. And so that seemed important to probably visit and document and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you, you don't know how like happy and how heartwarming it is to hear you say that, like that you have that much um, understanding and respect for how like complicated and layered and uh, amazing that final is in 2017. Uh, I think that for within the context of just Jenny Simpson's career, I think that that medal gets overlooked sometimes because I have a, a world championship um, and an Olympic medal. Uh, but 2017, that silver medal was was so like against the odds and in a race where just everybody was there, which I feel like honestly is every 1500 meters in the last eight or nine years is <laughs> like everybody is there. Um, you know, world record holders, current world record holders, and and medalists from world championships and Olympic championships and stuff. So they're always loaded. But 2017 was really kind of. Um, in a, in a league of its own in a lot of ways. And so to have come out triumphant from that. Um, but when I think about it, it's funny because, um, and, and I love this because my coach Heather uh, Burroughs was on the trip with us. And there's a couple of things. First of all, 
Jason had been in the stadium. Mark had been in the stadium. My former coach, Julie Benson, had all been in the stadium when I'd medaled before. And Heather had never been in the stadium, like live in person when I medaled. And that seemed like really important to me that she had that experience. So I remember going to the championships and thinking, you know, this time she got to be on the trip. And if she's, if she's ever going to be in the stadium when I medal, this is probably our best chance. Uh, and so that was a little bit on my mind. And then also, um, like I said, the year had just been really hard. And uh, I think, you know, normally my, my happy look on the sunny side of things uh, was just, it was just burdened. And I think in life, you just go through those types of cycles. Um, and sometimes you're just totally in a groove and sometimes you're in a little bit of a funk. Uh, and I definitely had a difficult, uh, progression up to the championships that year. And so it was funny how we got on the airplane and there was something that just transformed in me that once we got on the airplane and we were headed towards London, um, just my whole demeanor changed. And I think it was a little bit of, I've done this so many times that I know what it's supposed to feel like landing in the place where we have um, either our training camp or uh, world or Olympic championships. And I just allowed that part of myself that knows what this is supposed to feel to just kind of take over. And mm -hmm. even Heather reflected after that week that once we got to London, I just exuded an amount of confidence that I hadn't shown in months. Um, and I don't know exactly where that came from, but I was talking about meddling. I was talking about what I wanted to achieve each round and, and, and making it to the final. Um, and so I think just kind of allowing that attitude to take over, even when maybe I didn't have, according to my workouts the few weeks before, maybe didn't have necessarily the evidence to prove that I deserve to feel that confident. <laughs> um, I think that, that, that all really helps. So those are some of my big memories kind of leading into the race, but um, getting to the final, you know, anyone that is a big fan of, of track and field understands that when you make it to the starting gun of the final, there's already this incredibly difficult journey <laughs> to just get to that mm -hmm. point. So um, I remember just thinking, if you have made it this far, like you're 1500 meters away from this really difficult journey, kind of finding out what happens, you know, you get to turn the page and see what, what the, what the ending is. Um, and that just felt more hopeful to me than it felt, um, uh, burdened. And I think that mm -hmm. I hadn't necessarily felt that way through the, most of the year. So I just went into the race with the right frame of mind, even though it had been a, a challenging year. And then the actual race goes off. And I mean, like a lot of races, you don't, you don't remember every step of it. You kind of have these snapshots of memories of it. Um, I think your awareness is just at such a high level and there's only so much you can ever remember anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do remember that last 100 meters and there was such a big cluster of us and it's such a, an, a, an incredible and, and, and deep pool of talent right now that so often in the 1500 meters we're strung out. Um, and there's, and there's, you know, really, um, single file and spread out the last yeah. 300 meters or so. And this was totally different. <laughs> this is totally different. We were all in a group. It was all together. It was tightly packed. Um, and I remember coming down that finish line and it is terrible advice to ever take the inside. <laughs> like you never, ever take the inside. And I, I like to tell people it is in all of my years of racing, it has worked for me one time. It has only worked once out of all the times I've raced. Um, but it did, it did come together and work that day. And I remember coming around the curve and thinking about taking it a little bit wide, but just for some reason kind of sensing, or maybe I was just that, that, you know, fraction of a tick of a second behind that I was able to kind of intuitively feel and see that people were going wide. And so I stayed tight on the inside and people moved out and just an entire lane opened up um, for me to run the shortest line to the finish. And that, like I said, this is not like a clinic on racing because this is not something you should do. You should never expect that the inside lane will open up for you. It can be a dangerous tactic because people can feel you coming and they can close um, that inside lane for you. So always try to pass on the outside. Um, but I just saw it open up and it was just a perfect opportunity and I slipped in there. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that race, as far as like my memory is, um, I just remember finishing 
and uh, people have asked me because I celebrated so ridiculously. I was so excited. Um, <laughs> people have asked me like, if I actually thought I won because the margin of of victory yeah. and, and margin between medals was so slim. It's crazy when you finish how you know. Like it's like when you're racing a friend in in practice and you're doing strides or something and you're just neck and neck. You kind of know who outleans the other, um, whether you're the one in front or back. I mean, it's the same way in races. Even though it's so close, you, like you kind of know. So um, I definitely knew I was second, but it just was like this. I just couldn't have imagined that it was going to end that well. Like this whole incredible journey and struggle with lots of highs along with the lows um, and just sticking my nose in it every single time and saying, I'm just willing to see what happens if I, if I go as hard as I can. <laughs> um, and just to think that it ended that way, that I actually pulled it off and won another medal. Um, it just was a better ending that I, than, than I had imagined I could have scripted for myself. So um, I, I'm as proud of that finish as I am any finish in my career. When you were growing up, I think you, you probably were watching Bernard Lagat compete and everybody, he, they'd always, the cliche was the master tactician, right? Every single race, regardless, the, the master tactician. And I think now people say that about you because you find yourself in the right spot at the right time, whether that's passing on the inside, which as you mentioned, never works, but it worked just perfectly for you. Have you gotten better at that as you've gotten more experience and are able to see things slow down? Or, because to me, it's like, well, she's always kind of, been good at it so did it come with experience is it innate is it just a function of you being in really good shape so you're able to make better decisions like why is jenny simpson so tactically sound um i think first of all i've had really good coaches so between julie benson and mark wetmore and heather burrows i've had really good coaches that um coach all the way through practice you know you start in stretching circle and you end picking up your backpack headed towards the weight room and they coach the entire time. Um, and, and that's, that's really valuable to have a coach that's, that's there with you in the workout when it's going well, when it's going poorly, and then also there for you, there with you in the moments kind of in between. So you can have teammates doing different things and you can learn through a lot of these instances of practice. So I've had really great coaches. Um, I, I do think some of it, you, you can't immediately teach, like there are going to be people that just naturally are better at going over the steeple barriers than others. And some have to kind of catch up on that learning curve. So I do think maybe I was a little bit ahead of the learning curve for some reason. Uh, I had some, I have some kind of innate intuition to begin with. Um, but I, I really hope that some of it is um, a demonstration of me just being a good student of my sport uh, and, and, watching what other successful people have done and also watching what has in the past gotten really um, fit, ready people, gotten them in trouble. And you mm -hmm. watch, you know, different races and you can say, okay, this person did this and this at US championships, or they were ranked this in the world going into it and they didn't succeed. And is it possible that it wasn't just nerves? Is it possible that it wasn't an injury in the background that we didn't know of? Is it possible that they got in there and they just made a tactical mistake? Um, and I do think that that happens sometimes. And so how can you be prepared for the world championship? The first thing you can do is you can be in the best shape of your life. Like that's the most mm -hmm. obvious thing. The second thing is learning how to really mentally and emotionally prepare for the amount of stress and pressure and expectation. And then I think having a plan, and having a plan is not just, you know, I want to go in and I want to be really smart and make all the right moves and win. <laughs> a plan also mm -hmm. means like having contingencies for when things go wrong um, and knowing when you're going to get boxed in, what what you're going to what you're going to do about it. Or if you didn't plan to lead most of the race and suddenly find yourself out in front, or or whatever the case may be. So. Um, I do, I do hope that some of the skill has come from me just really caring a lot about knowing um, what has succeeded for others and what has failed for others. Um, so yeah, so I, I hope that's a part of it. When you watch back old races, if you ever do, or in just studying and preparing for your next big race, do you watch a race like 2017 and say, oh, I did that right, I did that right, I did that right, or do you go and you nitpick yourself and say, 
oh, but it would have been better if I made this decision or I stuck a little closer to, to her on this curve? It's both. I mean, it's, it's both. Mm -hmm. And the, the really difficult thing is when you're looking back at old races, you know what happened. So you pat yourself on the back for the smart things you did. And the truth is a lot of right. times the smart things you did were kind of a happy accident. <laughs> uh, and so learning to kind of admit that to yourself and say, okay, I did this thing that really worked well, um, but how much of it did I see and do intentionally and how much of it just kind of worked out um, as, as a happy accident. But to your point, I mean, the more that you do this, it's not even about like, um, it's, it's not even necessarily about like the repetition of having run the 1500 so many times, but you just get an increase, you know, there's so many permutations of how different athletes can interact with one another and, and, and different um, skills. Like if you have a great 800 meter runner in the mix or you have a great 500 or a 5K runner in the mix, how those strengths can kind of interact with each other. There's nearly an infinite number of possibilities how that can play out. Um, but the more that you run it and the more that you pay attention when you're racing and then go back and see the decisions that you made and then how those shook out for you, um, you just have physically been present in different sticky situations. Um, and hopefully uh, when it didn't work out well was like a season opener and you can make adjustments and learn from it. And, and by the time you get to the end of the season, um, but by the, and then the, the, then the last thing I'll say about it is that by the end of the season, when you're at the world championships, you have a pretty good idea of where your strengths are and, and especially mm -hmm. relative to the competition. So, you know, if you're the person that has the better chance by going out hard, or if you're the person that has a better chance, I'm praying for a slow race and a killer kick. So, uh, yeah. knowing those things about yourself and realizing that not every season is the same. Um, you know, 2017 for me is a perfect example. If that had been just a killer 356 race, um, mm -hmm. I don't think I was in the physical shape in 2017 that I was in 14, 15, and 16. So it would have been it would have been a different outcome for me, I think, if it had been hard from the gun. Um, but then there's other years like 2013 where I just knew I'm I'm one of the top three in the world right now, and I should go out mm -hmm. and run hard and make make everybody run hard. Um, and, and so I, I led that race. So just knowing that about yourself is, is a big part of, of, of having a plan for how the race will play out. Yeah. But there must've been something deep somewhere in your brain, maybe subconscious when you saw Hassan slide out that much that you're going to make this move that has a really low success rate, as you mentioned, before i don't know it, you maybe you raced her before maybe you could just maybe it was body language do you think just instinct kicked in at that point yeah because especially in the last 150 meters of a race there's so little oxygen now being delivered to your brain anyway <laughs> right <laughs> but I mean, any decisions that you're making uh are so like intuition um, and that's that's definitely where I think having a lot of racing experience can can really be to your benefit. Um, and there's people in the in the race that I think didn't do as well because they didn't have the same kind of just repetitive experience over and over and over. Um, and and so yeah, I definitely think your instincts are honed under duress when you've just done this mm -hmm. 100 times. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why 17 was so awesome in the lead up was you had all these champions, you had Semenya coming up from the 800. It was just a who's who at the time. And it's held up. A lot of those women have gone on to even greater heights since then. At the time when you were running it, did you have a sense that these would be people who would be, you know, some of the all time greats and not just, oh, they had one or two good years. And, you know, in 10 years, no one will probably think this race was as packed as it was. Yeah, I mean, I remember years before that being at Prefontaine and saying Faith Kipigon is just incredible and she's going to be one of the greats. And that was years before that. Um, and then she's gone to just be incredible as a 1500 meter runner. Um, so many, of course, was great. Um, Hassan, I mean, look at the, the range that she's had over the last few years. That race was just really loaded. And I remember going into that final uh, just thinking 
eight people here are going to share three mm -hmm. medals. Like eight people could could win this. Um, Laura Muir had been like right at that perfect edge of like so close to the medals um, uh, already at that point. And we're in London, right? So you kind of think, you mm -hmm. know, this might kind of elevate her experience um, and her ability. And so, yeah, I just remember thinking eight people are, are I mean, truly, truly could could make these top three spots. Um, and I'm, I'm going to keep myself in that mix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Muir's Muir's presence was the icing on the cake to have a hometown person in it. I mean, even you watch it on YouTube, it sounds so loud and she's making moves and the crowd is is reacting. It just added another layer there. Did you feel that at all? It was so reminiscent of 2012. So when we had mm. the Olympic Games in 2012 in that same stadium, uh, I mean, you would be on the starting line and they would introduce, you know, the person next to you, they'd introduce another person and then they'd introduce a British athlete, and it was deafening. It was incredible <laughs> the amount of noise that, that would just uh, envelop the stadium uh, as soon as they introduced a British athlete. And I remember actually in 2012 um, during one of the rounds, like I never, I never even heard the starters gun because the the crowd was just <laughs> so loud the entire time. And so uh, I I remember being in 2017 feeling like it was kind of a repeat of that same experience. Um, and, and it's great. Like, it's great to think that the crowd is so into this and we all have egos on the line. So when you're the one being <laughs> cheered for, I mean, that has to feel incredible. But when you're standing next to the person that gets that kind of attention, like all you want to do is, is beat them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the crowd interaction definitely, I think, brings another level for all the athletes. At least it does for me. I definitely wanted to, uh, I definitely wanted to show up the people they were cheering for. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you guys touched on on the on the film, and I want to dig in a little bit. I'll just ask a follow up because there's something I, I wish uh, we heard more about. Um, 2009, you know, Mark at, at cross country. Mark kind of takes responsibility for for your performance there. But one thing I found interesting because you said afterwards, you know, you had some work to do on the mental side of things to get to get back um, to where you wanted to be. Now you had made teams before that, but all total, you've made. 10 teams in a row. So obviously US teams, outdoor teams, like the pressure is something that you've thrived under, you know, forget medals, right? Making the team is hard enough. It's, it's nerve wracking right. for people watching at home, let alone being on the start line. So I'm wondering what actually happened post 2019, because it, you know, from, from an outside perspective, it seems like whatever it did put you in a, a mental state where you have not really shown any vulnerabilities since then and it's it's automatic almost at this point i know it's not actually automatic but that's what it seems like from the outside of jenny's gonna have her best race now other people might finish in front of her but she's gonna be ready at the trials and she's gonna be ready at the world championships and the olympics thank you yeah i mean honestly it gives me chills to hear you say that because that just is such i don't think there's a greater compliment you know the medals aside to just think that I can thrive under pressure is, it's it's so hard. And I've said before that I wouldn't wish this gift on my worst enemy because it's a terrible thing to be at your best uh, when when the pressure is that crushing. Um, but there is something about it that has, has historically really brought out the best in me. Um, but you're right, in 2009, I had that like not um, sort of, but actually physically crippling <laughs> pressure experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, I don't know that I've gone back and really tried to like fully, fully unpack and understand that experience. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share, I'll share what I can about, about that. So first of all, um, shortly after that, I did have a lot of trouble. I would, I would start, I, I, I would be in workouts. And the workout would start to get really hard. And I could feel that hyperventilating, like panic attack type of feeling start to happen. Um, and I think the biggest and most important thing was I just never gave in to it. And, and I don't mean give in to it, like, because there is a, the, a physically crippling element to it, but it's not like, oh, I'm just going to run through it. Like you can't just mm -hmm. uh, run through everything. But I never let it completely end my run or completely end my workout. Um, I would do whatever I was 
capable of until the run or the workout or whatever was over. And so I kind of let the assignment on the paper be in charge and not necessarily how I felt be in charge. So I think that was a, an important element to like the very initial, like, how am I going to get past this point um, and kind of past this, this, this anxiety and this panic. Um, I think also just having things and people um, that support you that have nothing to do with running is, is really good. Mm -hmm. um, because when something is so emotionally char charging and triggering, it's, it's good to have parts of your day that um, are just completely apart from that. So I think those two things are really good. Um, but what you had to say about like the years after that, um, I think one of the things that well, okay, I had made world teams and I had made cross country world teams and things like that. Um, but there was something, I mean, there's something about when you're on a division one team and you're running cross country and there's, you know, basically 300 athletes and you're trying to be the best one on that one day. There's something about college that is special and it's so important. Um, and it feels, um, it feels just so much more intimate in a lot of ways than your experience on other teams throughout your life, even high school and elite so on either ends of the equation there's just something about those four precious five years in college um, that just feel really important and precious and mm -hmm. intimate and and so, so i think that that kind of pressure was different than than making a world team um because it's not okay. just like oh i want to do this because this shows how great of an athlete i am but there's so many personal relationships attached to your success in college um, and so, you know, that race was <laughs> my last race in a Colorado, Colorado uniform, that cross country race in 2009. Um, so I do think the context was, was different. Um, but then once I kind of got over the fact that that went so terribly wrong, um, and then made other teams, you know, the, the USA team that I made right after that, um, in 2011 was the hardest team I've ever had to make. Uh, bar none, because, you know, like you said, you just kind of get over this hump of like, am I ever going to be good again? Um, and so making that team, I think was really important. But then a perfect example is like, I don't know that I really thought a lot about kind of mentally overcoming 2009, as much as I did when things went wrong at the world championships in 2015. And when I was running the final mm. and oh, to this day, it with just the shoe, if people don't know, that's the shoe. That's the shoe race. If people don't know, yeah. Yeah, it just breaks my heart to think about that that race in particular because in such amazing shape. The year before, I'd been ranked mm -hmm. number one in the world. I came in and it was kind of like 2017, where it was like everybody that was good was at their best, and everybody was in that final. Um, mm -hmm. And about 700 meters in, um, my shoe got clipped. My shoe comes off, and I end up finishing the race, but not basically racing from that point forward. Um, and so, but I. I remember finishing that race, walking around, and you have to go straight into this mix zone. So you have to go immediately and talk to media. And so to kind of buy myself some time to like figure out like, what am I gonna say? How do I feel? What just happened? Is this really real? Um, to buy myself some time, I, I walked around the track to go pick up my shoe. And so I went over and mm -hmm. race official at it. And I remember walking around the track and just trying to think like, what, like, is this real? Is this a nightmare? Is, did this really happen? And I remember thinking, I have been here before. Like I have had this feeling before. And it mm -hmm. like uh, transported me back to that experience of like waking up and seeing the cross country course like right in front of my face, like the grass, you know, I'm, I'm laying on yeah. the ground and I'm wait a minute, this is this one of these terrible nightmares that you dream of, you know, the week before NCAA championships. Um, but I remember walking on the track and thinking, I've been here before. And I remember really viscerally feeling like I've been here before, I've had something this horrible happen and I was fine. And I just remember thinking, I'll be okay. Like this, this is not going to be the end. Um, and, and if I hadn't had that experience in 2009, I don't know that I would have had that kind of, it's hard to explain, but that sense of peace that um, bad things happen and sometimes bad things yeah. happen at the worst possible time and in front of everybody. And I'm walking around the stadium with one shoe on in this, you know, in my USA uniform with all these hopes of coming home with another medal. Um, in the Olympic Stadium, you know, we were in China in the Olympic Stadium where, where, I, where I ran my first Olympic Games. And I just remember thinking, 
I've I've been here before. It's been this bad before, and I I rose again, and and I can do it. Um, and so I went into the mix zone kind of with that attitude. And so the benefit of 2009 didn't really bear fruit until 2015. But because of that, after that race in 2015, the truth is, honestly, I didn't skip a beat. Um, I went and started mm -hmm. racing right after that. I ran my fastest 3K of my life. I think it's still, maybe, I think it's still my PR is the 3K I ran like two weeks after that. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have to fact check that. I don't know if that's 100% true. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, it just, it, I didn't skip a beat. I went right back into it and I knew I was going to be fine. And, um, and it's, it's, it's that lesson felt learned, um, in 2015 for sure. No athlete wants to have disappointments, but when you look at your career as a whole, it, for lack of a better term, it feels like you've had the ideal amount of disappointments in order to both fuel you to greater heights and also appreciate the highs when you, when you get them. Yeah, I, I, I feel like when you sign up for sports, you know that you sign up for the good and the bad. And if instead of just saying like, sometimes they're gonna be really good and sometimes they're gonna be really bad. Um, I think if you have an outlook where you say, I want to experience all of it. And the story mm -hmm. won't be complete unless I have the mountaintops and I have the valleys. Um, then you just, you get to see it as a bigger picture. And it's not, it's even more than like, oh, step back and see it in a bigger picture. It's just that you see that there's this really awesome story unfolding and every story has its roller coaster moments. And so yeah. uh, I do think I've had kind of the perfect amount of disappointment because those disappointments were always followed by resiliency. And you can have one disappointment in your life or you can have five major disappointments in your life, but if it's followed by resiliency, then it, it, it doesn't ever come across as crushing or like, this is the end of the story. It's like, oh, that bad thing had to happen. So then we could have this beautiful ending. Um, and so if you're in that pit right now, think of it that way. Like this valley has to exist in order for there to be a triumphant ending. You're just on your way there. You're not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even Usain Bolt lost in the end. Right? His, his script wasn't perfect and he had the most... <laughs> I guess, you know, pre-programmed, like you thought it was going to hit all these beats, but sports doesn't really care about that because it's supposed to be a meritocracy. So losses can happen. Disappointments can happen. You can lose a shoe. You can pull a hamstring. Like all that stuff is, yeah. is fair game. Uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you two questions about current day, Jenny. We haven't seen you race since, I guess, winter last year, pre-COVID. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I think that's correct. Yeah, right. um, this has been the longest break from training since I was a middle schooler. Or so not training, yeah. excuse me, from racing. My longest, my I was longest say. break from racing since I was a middle schooler. <laughs> no, I'm still training. I was gonna say the Olympic trials in three months. So, I mean, we trust your tactics, but you might wanna train too. <laughs> um, I'm assuming, I thought in my mind, I thought, well, maybe she'll dabble in the five, but now that they've moved the five to the beginning of the trials, I'm assuming the emphasis is going to be still on the, on the 15 and we'll be seeing you in some, some races pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm planning to run a 15 at the end of this month. Um, but no, you're right. It's, it's, it's such a, like, it's so sad that they changed the schedule around and I have no idea why they changed the schedule, but now the 1500 and the 5k are, is an impossible double. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so, so anyway, that's out the door for better or for worse. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm going to run a 15 at the end of the season or at the, why am I, these are not, uh, four <laughs> here. I'm, <laughs> hopefully I'm still running. <laughs> Do you have an um, announcement no, you want to make, Jenny? <laughs> no, no, at the end of the month, I'm going to run one. Um, and yeah, that, that'll, that'll be my focus. And. It's, it's funny after this, I mean, this year has just given all of us a lot of time to think about what do we want to do? What do we want the future to look like? What do we want today's present weird, like sort of um, step away from racing to look like and so forth. Um, and it's just, it's reignited in me that I'm so lucky to be good at the 15 because it's just such a dynamic and such an exciting race. Um, and I've really enjoyed uh, training for it over the years. Um, I think I've always had this kind of fear that as I get older, I won't be good at it anymore and I'll have to be like forced out into another event. Um, but, but no, I just, 
this year has just has just reminded me how yeah how lucky I am that I'm good at at, at an event that's just so exciting and if if I wasn't a 1500 meter runner I still think that would be um, my favorite race to watch as a fan because man it's just so dynamic and 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 it attracts um both you know the speedy 800 meter runners and then those kind of traditional strength distance runners and it's fun to watch those matchups so um so yeah that's that's my plan are you nervous at all to jump back into racing after such a long break yeah yeah i'm really nervous <laughs> and it's funny because <laughs> you mentioned um you mentioned like all the teams that i've made and and, and performing well under pressure um, I think it's important to say, I get nervous. I mean, after all these years, you don't get used to it. Um, you work so hard and you want all that hard work to pay off. And so uh, still a, past a decade into being a 1500 meter runner, I still will toe the line and I'll still be anxious about it. Um, but the benefit that I have is all these years of running logs that say, hey, if you can do this at training, then you can do this on race day. Um, and mm -hmm. that's really what I'm what I'm going to lean on, especially after having such a long break from, from racing is just saying, okay, we know, um, the different benchmark workouts that have indicated, um, what kind of racing I'm capable of. And I'll lean on those to kind of set my expectations, um, for the early season races. Speaking of nerves as it pertains to the Olympic trials, but not to the race itself, there's so much uncertainty, all these meets, you know, there's different protocols, there's testing procedures. We've seen athletes not be able to race due to, due to contact tracing. What, I don't want to say nervous, but what are you concerned about or what more information do you need to have about that would, I don't know, just, just help your preparation in terms of, of how the trials will be conducted or how do you know the trials will be conducted? Because there hasn't been, frankly, a lot of information about how that meet is going gonna, is gonna to work with so many athletes. Yeah, I mean, we have been through so much, like, it, it seemingly broken promises, right? Where, and it's, it's, I don't mean that in like any sort of malicious way, but, you know, people say, hey, this is how something's going to be. And whether it's in your personal life or in your work life or in your sporting mm -hmm. life, I mean, no one can make any promises. And so you feel <laughs> like if you attach yourself to any sense of security, um, you're likely to to also then feel betrayed. <laughs> so um, it's been a year of that, and that's been really tough. Um, but as we work towards the trials, I, I think I stole this from, um, I think I heard this from somebody in the military, but very early in the pandemic, somebody, like I said, this isn't an original idea, but I heard it from somebody else that I'm not, don't make a plan, just be prepared for anything. And so that's kind of been my mantra is like, I don't, I don't have a plan for exactly what the future holds, but I'm going to try to be prepared for anything. Um, and that's really helped. It's helped when we've had facilities shut down, when we've had, um, I've had training partners that unfortunately, you know, got sick or you have um, um, the Olympic Training Center, like the Olympic Training Center shut down in Colorado Springs for a while. And so the place mm -hmm. you kind of rely on for, for, for medical contacts and stuff like that. So, even when the, the people and the things that you thought were as rock solid as they could possibly be are now kind of on shaky ground or were, um, yeah, I've just kind of adopted this mantra of, I have no plan, but I'm prepared for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with so much uncertainty, what else What else can you, can you do? Have you heard anything about how trials will be structured? Again, we've seen how other sports are doing it, but you know how unwieldy track and field is. There's so many people involved in it so many officials so many days so many disciplines and there's so many competing interests because mm -hmm. in some sports a lot of a lot of team sports you have multiple teams that to varying degrees have a lot of overlapping desires and interests and can kind of work towards and mm -hmm. maybe i'm speaking a little bit out of turn but from the outside that's what it seems like in track and field you have throwers you have sprinters you have coaches you have agents you have distance runners you have all kinds of different people from all over the country with all kinds of ideas about how this will run the most smoothly and having all of those collide. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I can only imagine logistically what that's like. And I'm glad that I'm an athlete, not an administrator through, through a lot of this. Um, but I laugh a little bit when you ask me, have I heard anything? Because anyone that knows me knows that I'm the last to hear anything. So anything <laughs> I know, 
has been like out and announced in public knowledge for a week before I before I realize what's going on. So even okay. though I'm the really elite athlete that's been to so many of the championships, um, I might conjure up in my imagination what I think could play out, but officially announcements, I'll hear it about a week late. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping your head down. That's good. Staying focused. Yeah. Yeah. Got the <laughs> bunker mentality. Well, this has been great, Jenny. Thank you so much. Again, the, the flow film is on YouTube right now for you to watch. Uh, Jenny Simpson transcend is the name two parts, but people can check it out. Uh, best of luck at your first race at the end of the month, Jenny, and in your pursuit for another Olympic team. We appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me.